This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Craig LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Jeff Parker, who is a professor of engineering at Dartmouth College, also a visiting scholar uh, and um, research fellow at MIT, uh, and also the co-author of this book, The Platform Strategy, How Network Markets Are Transforming the Economy and How to Make Them Work for You, which Jeff is a couple of years old now, but, um, and um, you've told me that you're going to revise it, but, uh, it seems to have had such an enormous impact. Um, I think it's, it's almost impossible to talk to business people now without them recognizing that they have to, um, think seriously about converting their businesses into platform businesses. You know, one of the punchlines that I use in, in all of my talks uh, I, I, I didn't realize it, but I think I might've either stolen it from you or I might've, uh, <laughs> arrived at it at the same time as you. And, and that is to appropriate, uh, Mark Andreessen's famous quote that software is eating the world. And I usually have a slide that says something like, you know, platforms are, are eating, eating the world. And so I, I want to talk to you a bit about, you know, platforms, but I also want to kind of test the limits of, of platforms and, and talk about the extent to which it really does make sense to talk about every business becoming a, a platform business. You know, at some point it, 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 the metaphor, you know, starts to, starts to encounter some, some limits. Um, but maybe we can start off by kind of defining the difference between what you refer to as, as a pipeline business, right? And you say that, you know, traditional businesses are like pipelines, uh, which aligns with kind of the, the typical value chain, uh, the value creation that happens in this, in this linear fashion. To, to this new uh, business model, which we call uh, platforms. And then we'll talk also about like, well, what is new and what is not new? Um, because, you know, this, this is not, somebody didn't wake up one day and say, let's create a completely new business model. This is something that, that is grown out of um, organizational forms that have been around for a while. Yeah, so where would you like me to begin? First of all, Greg, great to be with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and yeah, the it? book is... Um, six years old now, and we can go through what we're going to change, but obviously the landscape has changed quite a bit. Uh, and really we did a lot of the major writing in the say 2014, 2015 timeframe. Uh, and I'd say the platform kind of landscape has exploded, uh, and, and you know, along a couple of important dimensions, I think two are worth pointing out in particular. One is that we're seeing. Uh, an awful lot going on in the B2B space where I think a lot of what we learned, you'll, you'll see our B2C examples, um, business to consumer and a lot of the growth and, and frankly, a lot of the interest in companies is more on, okay, that's nice, but what looks like my business and I, you know, my customers or other businesses and, uh, how does that apply? And so we're doing a lot of research, um, as you mentioned through the, uh, MIT initiative on the digital economy and and with a lot of other, uh, firms, uh, really running those down. Um, and then the other area is just the explosion, I think of regulatory interest, mm -hmm. um, where we're seeing, for example, the relatively recent digital markets act in the European commission, um, the general, the GDPR, um, uh, that was a couple of years before that. Um, and then I'm, you know, California, <laughs> he's sort of like things jump from the EU to California and back. Um, and you know, we'll see where that lands. And when, if you want to talk a bit more about what we see in that space, um, mm -hmm. uh, let's certainly dive in, but I'll stop there and, uh, you can ask a couple more things for sure. But let's, let's, let's get back to some of the conceptual ideas that you introduce in the book, right? So this idea of a, a, a pipeline, right? How, how can we. If you think about a typical company, how does it make sense to think of them as, as a pipeline? Um, yeah. So, a, a, as you said, a, a typical linear value chain, um, is kind of the way that we've thought about going to market and doing business, um, for a really long time. Uh, I'm going to take a quick pause here, Greg. Okay. And the reason is I have a cat in my studio <laughs> and it's like Zoom. And right. it's an awesome thing, but on the other hand, she's pawing at the door and making a lot of noise. Could you hear it? I could. Yeah. Um, she wants to be I'm, part of the program. 
She does want to. Well, actually, she stepped up on the desk and joined a a regulation event um, <laughs> a few weeks ago. So that was, that was something. I, she seems to have stopped for a moment. So let's go. Okay. All right. So I'm going to rewind and take it to the top so we're, we're not live happily. You can post produce this. Okay, so great, great question on on pipelines and platforms. So we think of pipes as the standard way uh, that we've always thought about delivering products and services. You, you kind of start at the beginning with either an information input, some data, um, or some news that you'll then collect um, and analyze and turn that into sort of articles or some sort of intermediate product and then assemble it to a final product. Same thing with manufacturing. You'd start with some kind of raw materials and then create sub assemblies and then um, get it all assembled, say, for example, like a car, and then send that out to a, a consumer. So, or if you just want to stay with a, a like a, a, a market context, you might think of a retailer. So a retailer mm -hmm. would purchase something like a television or a book or a shirt, uh, and then resell it to an end consumer. And mm -hmm. so all of those are essentially, um, pipes or linear value chains. So pipe platforms are, are different. So to just be true. So we always, it's very clear what's the input and what's the output, right? It's very yes. clear. Yeah. You've got, you know, you're, you, you're, you've got, you're buying some flour and you're buying some, you know, sugar and you're buying some eggs and then you're selling cakes. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you know, it's, it's, it's from a, like sort of an, end, uh, operations perspective, it's, it's very clear exactly. how. And I think yeah. that's a really good point is that the flows are pretty clear. They tend to move in one direction. Um, and then, you know, money moves up to compensate the supply chain partners. Yeah, so the supply, so the supply goes on. this way and then the money goes that way. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's a metaphor and that kind of long chain form has, has been around forever. Now platforms have a more triangular form. There's some sort of, a uh, uh, um, a, uh, intermediary or a market, for example. And so we would recognize this if we were to go back to the year 1000, any village would have market day and they would have buyers and sellers and those buyers and sellers could transact with one another, um, in that village marketplace. And in many ways that has all of the platform features, you know, minus a few technological ones, but. Um, many of the platform features that we would expect to see today. So for example, you might have the ability to make a contract. So there'd be legal services, or you might have the ability to take out a loan. So there would be financial services. You might, for example, sell forward. So there might be some sort of a futures market. Mm -hmm. Um, those would all be services that would come together in this multi-sided platform that was the village market. Uh, so you might say, okay, what's the big deal? This is something that's been around for thousands of years, if not more. And, and I think what's different now is, uh, along a few dimensions. So one is that because of network connectivity, we have extended the boundaries of these systems so that they are, you know, first regional, then national, and now truly global. Um, and the other is that the system itself ends up providing kind of reusable building blocks of technology or of contracts or services. Um, all of this means that the transaction costs have fallen like a rock. And so that allows scale, um, to occur in ways that we've never saw before. So the network effects, and we'll, we, you should ask me sort of to be more specific. Um, but network effects are essentially where the system becomes more valuable as a function of the number of people who use it. They were always there in the village marketplace. You had to have a thick market to exchange, but they were limited by transaction costs. You had a, 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 a circle around which it made no sense to go to market because it took you more than a day to get there or more than a week to get there, whatever the boundary might be. That's all fallen away. And so now all of a sudden we have this ability to aggregate um, relatively small network effects across very large numbers of users. Um, so that's frankly changed the economic landscape of the world. Well, we will, we should talk about network effects, but I think, you know, economists sometimes when they look at network effects, they, they think about them as, um, 
sometimes uh, arising through spontaneous action, right? So for instance, if, if I start, you know, if, if two of us decide to meet in a, some location and start selling things, then, you know, sooner or later, other people will start, you know, locating in that same place. Or if, you know, if you and I start driving on the right side of the road, then, you know, everybody else is going to start driving on the, and so there's this idea of a spont spontaneity, but, but I think, um, more importantly is this idea that you can be an entrepreneur who kind of drives it, or, you know, it could be top down governmental imposition of, of some rules that will drive these, these network effects. And, and so a, a lot of the book is really about, you know, how you can strategically, uh, leverage these network effects or, or, or jumpstart them. So, so maybe, you know, talk a bit about how you, how you see network effects. I mean, you're coming, you're an engineer, uh, and most of the people that I talk to, uh, on, on this, on this show are, are, are business people or economists. And, and, and so, you know, they, they, they come at it typically from the, 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 the business perspective, but there's, there's quite a bit of similarities, right. Between network effects in, uh, systems and, and network effects in, in, in businesses and in marketplaces and economics, right. I, I mean, so, so great kind of preamble and I love this idea of, of kind of almost the accidental network effect, mm -hmm. which I think is, or spontaneous that you're getting at. Um, and I think some of that, um, was trial and learning by doing what's different now is we have enough examples of businesses that are successful because of network effects that we can be much, we can reason from that. And we can look at it and say, okay, that's where the source of value is. So the users are cap, you know, getting value from the system, not just by what it does, but also by the presence of other users and then be super intentional. And as you say, that goes right down to the design. So you have to line up the design of these systems and businesses so that they foster network effects, uh, um, at least the positive ones, but equally important is to detect negative network effects, uh, you know, prevent bad behavior because those are just as, as deadly as the positive ones are beneficial. Mm -hmm. And, and you talk about sort of, uh, the chicken and egg problem. And, and this is something which, you know, it, I talk about all the time in my, my strategy class, right. And I'll, I'll just put some student on the spot and I'll say, okay, so, um, you, you got to sell the first component, right? And then tell me what your conversation sounds like. And, and you mentioned in the book that whoever sold the first telephone should get the, uh, award for, for a salesperson of, of, you know, of all time. Um, but you know, you can come up with this fantastic idea, but, but how do you, how do you take it to market? How do you jumpstart the, the process? A big part of the book is, is about this, this chicken and egg, uh, you know, go to market strategy. Yeah. So, so super point and. Of course, you'll, I'll give you the economist tesser because I wear that hat sometimes. Um, it depends. It depends on the nature of, of the transaction and whether the platform itself can enter the supply side. So often one of the best ways to start a platform is to actually be a pipeline. And by that, I mean, get a bunch of users because you, you were able to create something of value and then get them on board. And then once they're affiliated with your system. Yeah. That's the time to open it up so that you can then start to have supply coming, not just from your firm or your organization, but others who can participate. Right. Um, you point out that Amazon, of course, you know, began its life as, as a pipeline, really. Exactly. And they were a reseller. So they purchased books and then CDs and other kind of easily, um, ordered catalog items took control of that inventory, resold it to end users. And then the beauty, and I mean, there are a lot of interesting things in, in sort of what they've done, but th that big user base of theirs was attractive to other sellers. And so then they created the systems and tools to give other sellers than themselves access to their buyers. Right. I remember when they first did that, I kept thinking, well, you know, is, is Amazon a place for, you know, do we, should we think of it as a place where we can sort of source our books or should we think about it as a place where, you know, vendors can, uh, you know, source distribution, right. And, um, and a lot of it, you know, as an economist, you're always fo sort of focusing on who's paying whom. Um, 
you know, rather than just looking at sort of the end result, you're focused on, well, who's, who's paying whom? And we see those, and, and, you know, as an economist, you can think, well, the price can just go from positive to negative, but there's a, there's a real structural difference once you move from a, a world where, you know, everybody is paying in one direction to one where the payments go in, in multiple directions. And just to get back to that marketplace example, the medieval marketplace, right? There's, there's a, there's a key difference between a scenario where the market place organizer is is paying the provisioners uh and a world where the you know provisioners are paying to to access the the marketplace right those are those are structurally different and the choice that the marketplace would make depends it's essentially who needs who the most Mm -hmm. you know do the buyers need the sellers more do the sellers need the buyers more and so who gets to come in imagine that you have the marketplace gated Well, somebody gets to come in for free and somebody has to pay because the operations of the system have to get, you know, um, accounted for somewhere. Usually in that situation, it's the sellers who end up paying Mm -hmm. and then they end up allowing the buyers to come in. Um, and then the sellers are essentially paying for the right to get access to the buyers. Mm -hmm. So you say that if, look, if. I mean, you, you have eight different ways of, of kind of solving the chicken egg problem, but if, if this idea of starting as a pipeline is, is, a, is a viable one, then that means there's hope for, you know, the vast majority of, of companies out there that are still, you know, pipelines. So, um, you know, one of the examples you use in the book is, is McCormick foods, right? Here's a company that, yeah. that sells spices right? and I can just yeah, imagine the conversation. Old school, I right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether, I don't know whether you, you actually worked with them or not, but I can just try to imagine the conversation where you're sitting down with the company that's like making spices and you're saying, Hey, you know, you should think of yourself as a, as a platform company, right? What would that even, what would that even look like? Right. I mean, what would the brainstorming exercise look like for, for a company like that? Yeah. So essentially I I think the way to think about it is how do I find different sources of value Mm -hmm. that my users and the users can be on the supply side or or on the demand side, um, can take advantage of that will make it stickier. So here, if, if you end up creating this user to user experience, and so that's this notion of kind of recipe innovation and then allowing for sharing um, among the consumers of, of the spices, then that makes them naturally want to affiliate with that system. And so that's additional sources of value. And what's wonderful about it is it doesn't cost the company anything other than the kind of fixed cost of the infrastructure to set it up. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, I thought pretty neat. And you can take that metaphor and I've seen it in other materials industries. So if essentially spices and materials. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, chemical firms, so BASF, for example, um, is trying to think through its platform opportunities where it would use the, um, it would use its, its digital twin, if you will, Mm -hmm. of materials as kind of the core that says, Hey, now you can mix and match and specify materials and then do simulation of how that would work in a manufacturing environment, uh, And then, and here's where the fuses will break for the firms. Um, a decision is, do you only sell your own materials or is it more important to have the customer relationship, which means then that you cross sell. Mm -hmm. And so I I just did a fireside chat with, uh, Jiber rule who, um, was CEO of Klockner steel for about 12 years. And that's exactly what he, he did as part of the digital transformation process. They built a marketplace. And on that marketplace, they invited competitors. Mm -hmm. And so you can well imagine the difficult conversations among some of the business unit leads when literally they view people who their mission in life is to prevent them from selling to their customers. You're giving them direct access to the customers. So you can, Mm -hmm. you have to imagine then that they're thinking of other revenue streams or other ways of, of kind of stickiness that you would want to keep that customer that user in your orbit Mm -hmm. but in that case it's it's the platform owner that has the direct relationship with the the customer right that's that that's key they're they're the ones that have the first party customer data um and so you know we think about uh, a company that delivers food right i'm mcdonald's and i used one of these 
providers to, to deliver my food to the, to the customer. Uh, if they, if they place the order with me and then I send the order over to Grubhub, that's very different than if they place the order with Grubhub, which then turns around and places the order with, with McDonald's. Right. And so do, are you seeing companies, everyone's trying to kind of leapfrog everyone else to be the one that sits, absolutely. you know, at the, at the, at the yeah. customer face. I, I, and I think it's absolutely a race and a fight for control of that customer facing layer. Mm -hmm. Um, so I love your Grubhub and McDonald's example. Um, I'll give you another one. It, it's in the, uh, it's in the TV and cable space. So we've got, so on my system upstairs, I'll have tons of different subscription services, Hulu and yeah, HBO yeah. and Netflix and Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I think is really interesting is what Comcast has done with their voice technology. And so in a specific realm, they've done a pretty neat job on the artificial intelligence side of creating a voice interface. You can search for something mm -hmm. you just push the remote and you search for it. And then it sifts through all of your rights mm -hmm. and all the different yeah. um, systems and then it presents it. So then yeah. all of a sudden what happened? They just shoved all yeah. of those different services, one layer under and created a new customer interface layer. That's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. So that's, so, so that's kind of this, this shift from kind of the, the horizontal stack to the vertical stack and then back again. And so, you know, Netflix created the, the, the integration layer, which allowed you to access all the different content from all the different studios. Right. And then all the studios decided to withdraw from Netflix, go direct to the customer. And now the customer is faced with this bewildering array of, of, of apps that they have to somehow remember, connect with different, you know, content. Right. And then, you know, that creates a demand for, for a new kind of integration layer. Um, and, and it sounds like Comcast is, is stepping into that, to that, that breach, but you could imagine someone like you know, Netflix saying we're, we're not, we're going to shut off access. We don't want Comcast doing this. We can deny them right through terms of service access to our API. And then, um, and then you'll be forced to go to Netflix first. I mean, this is kind of Southwest pulling out of, you know, kayak and, and orbits or, right. um, you know, wanting to drive you to, to, to their app directly. Um, could you, do you, do you see this as a sort of a, a constant, uh, you know, back and forth, uh, between everyone trying to do this and, and another great story that, that is, uh, this company called segment. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, these guys, but their, their goal was to become the, uh, one-stop shop for all marketing apps, right? So, uh, you know, if you're a CMO, you have all these different data streams coming in and then you have all these different apps. And so you have all these engineers that are stitching together all the different data streams to all the different apps. And so they're like, oh, look, we'll just create like a hub and spoke thing. So you only have to put stuff in here. And then we have all, we have the app store. And of course, I think Adobe was like, wait, hold on. You know, we have a full suite of marketing products. We were not really keen on being part of, you know, uh, uh, this, this app store would like you to come directly to us. And then that creates a bit of a a conflict because everyone wants to be the one that's that's right in front so su super notion this idea that you're going to get cycling and part of it is if you start to see customer drop off because you added transaction costs and that's mm -hmm. what your netflix example was was literally just adding a cost to the to the end user maybe they're big enough to get away with it maybe they're not I mm -hmm. think a smaller network would have a hard time dictating those terms. Um, a larger network might get away with it, but if you aggregate enough small sort of bits of content, then it can start to look like a much bigger thing. Um, so to your point, I think you see ebbs and flows on that. So, so then I think you're in your book, it's just as important. You, you talk about lock-in, but then you talk about kind of failed lock-in, right? And you talk about positive network effects and then you talk about negative network effects and you, you use some examples, right? You know, we think of MySpace, right? And how, how MySpace, um, kind of fumbled the ball, um, you know, relative to, to, to Facebook. Um, and so, you know, what, what are some of the, um, what, I mean, the book is rife with examples, but you know, in terms of failed failure to launch in, in, in this space of, you know, trying to create a platform, what, what are some of the pitfalls that, that companies typically make? Yeah. So I, the ones that I think 
are really deadly are where they try to capture value before they create it for users. And, and that's a cautionary tale, I think, especially for kind of incumbents who are, are pipeline firms. You know, then they analyze, they, you know, dream up some total addressable market and they get starry eyed and um, get all excited about that. And then they go after it and then they figure out all their monetization models and they have a bunch of, you know, their finance folks cranking away at spreadsheets. Um, and it all looks wonderful. But of course, as you said at the beginning, you still have to de deliver value to a user. And uh, I love what Ming Zheng um, told us. He, he spoke for us at one of our, our platform summits uh, several years ago. Um, he was the chief strategy officer for Alibaba. He's like, you know, people don't buy a platform. They buy what it can deliver in products or services. And, and kind of losing track of that, what's the user problem that you're trying to solve? What's a solution you can put in place? How do you know that that's working? And none of that sounds like platform and it shouldn't. That's really being good at product, but that comes before. And I think sometimes the failure points are trying to extract value at the idea of the end state mm -hmm. of the system. Like imagine that it's up and running and this is wonderful. Yeah, but at the beginning it's not. And so you've got to lead those consumers and users on it, on your journey. Well, and Alibaba, of course, is a great example because they came into a market that was already dominated by eBay in, in, in China. And I think eBay, uh, may have thought they had the whole thing locked up given the success that they had at achieving, you know, more or less monopoly status in the U S. Yeah. And so, not so much. <laughs> right. And so what, what would do? What were the mistakes that eBay made, right? Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't have enough detail on the, uh, on the China example, so I'd be remiss to try to really, to really run that one down. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think more broadly, the, the failure points, as you say, um, you see them in lots of places. One of them is this failure to deliver the right value. You, um, I, I think another one is, is not understanding who needs who. And it's literally not measuring where the network effects are likely to come from. Um, and so potentially monetizing in the wrong area. Um, another one that I think is important is when your revenue side is somebody else's subsidy side, that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody else has identified your user base and said, actually, they're my free side because I'm monetizing them, um, through some other mechanism, that's pretty tough to compete. And so you get to think, well, okay, now you go back to what's the value proposition. Do I really need to monetize directly? And if I do, then how do I overcome sort of this other version of whatever my product or service is that's literally free. You give an example of how you can kind of piggyback on other, uh, networks, right? So the, I think probably the most well-known example is how Airbnb uh, did a lot of early customer acquisition through, um, through Craigslist where they just kind of, yeah. uh, scraped Craigslist and, and kind of, you know, and, uh, just, just sort of said, well, okay, these guys already have the, the, the network. Um, people are already going there. Um, it sucks, but people are, you know, going there cause they know that's where everything is. And so if we can just sort of insert ourselves into that, um, network and, and sort of skim off all the incoming traffic, then we can bootstrap our, our, our network. Um, do networks need to, um, kind of keep an eye out for that right? and, and, and prevent, uh, prevent, prevent others from kind of, uh, just coming in and, and, and swallowing up all, all their user base. So, I th so absolutely. I think you've got to be aware of what's happening on your network and, you know, that's part of, of kind of the organizational muscle that needs to be built by a firm is these detection mechanisms. Uh, and I'd like to think that that's in effect, a variation of disintermediation where other firms are trying to peel transactions off, off platform that really should occur on platform. And so that's always a danger where once you make a match, then if the parties want to transact in the future, they'll just transact with one another directly. Right. It's, it's that early on, first of all, the identification 
um, and then learning to trust one another where the platform adds a lot of value. Depending on the nature of the transaction, um, it may not add as much value down the road. And so that's the area where you really need to be careful in the, the monetization, because if you take too much of a rake, then sure, they're going to disappear. Mm -hmm. And so all of, the, I'd say the, the kind of, um, intellectual, um, kind of work, the, the knowledge work types of platforms are in danger of that kind of disintermediation. Mm -hmm. If you take too high of a percentage cut, then people will just transact directly. Right. Like Upwork, uh, or, um, I think Perfect. HomeJoy, Example. a couple of these other uh, thumbtack, yep. right? So if there's an um, ongoing relationship at stake, then, uh, you know, you, you need to have, if you can't monetize it upfront with the intro, but of course no one's going to pay up front for a big intro if they don't really know. I mean, if you're buying a house, then you have some expectation you're going to live in this house for a long period of time, but right. yeah. Um, yeah, so you so also say, yeah, I mean, that's just part of the design of the system then is yeah. to, to kind of anticipate that. So you, you met, you referred to kind of platform strategy as like three dimensional chess and, and kind of regular strategy is like one dimensional chess. And I think part of this has to do with the idea that, you know, competing in an industry versus competing in an, in an ecosystem is, is very, very different. And I think you, you, you even say somewhere that, um, management of externalities, uh, is really kind of a key uh, leadership skill. And it's different from kind of managing a, a, uh, an organization that has clear, clear boundaries and clear, uh, chain of command and, and so forth, because every single component of that production process is, is more or less engaging in a, in a kind of a spot market transaction. Right. And so they, they, they can, they, they, they're continually in danger of, of peeling off and, and, you know, bypassing you in some way. Yeah. So I, I think that firms, and again, if we go back to incumbent firms that have run successful operations, they've got, you know, people who know exactly what they're doing in running sort of a more pipeline business, they can end up having some blinders on this one, um, where there are investments that need to be made in the organization around how do I engage the ecosystem? How do I detect when things are going wrong? And you'd say, Hey, isn't that what our marketing and sales functions have done always? And I'd say, sure, but mostly on the, the kind of buyer side in the platforms, the other side, the supplier side is to be treated as a valued customer as well, because if you lose them, then the thing can start to spiral down. So would, I mean, one approach is to say, look, t let's take the skills and, and the capabilities that we've used in marketing up until now, and let's just kind of, you know, drag and drop it over into supplier relationships or drag and drop it over to employee relationships or, and just think of, you know, let's just have a dozen different, you know, marketing departments that cover all of the potential uh, sides of our, our business, right. And all the different, you know, groups of, of complementers that, that we have. Um, I mean, is that, is that a sensible approach or, or is, is there something different about, you know, uh, the, the, the marketing itself that, that has, that has to change once you're a platform. So I think, so where I'd say there's a big difference is in the self-serve notion of a platform, because if you want to keep transaction costs low, then having kind of traditional marketing and sales teams mm -hmm. that have these long sales cycles, it doesn't scale. And so I'd say that's where one of the big differences would be that it's, it's kind of more inbound. So firms that have already mastered that are, are kind of ready. Um, but if you look, for example, at the switch over of point to point connections to a more usable application programming interface. So we get a little weedy here, but the notion that you could expose services and data through something that you could publish that anybody could connect to mm -hmm. and it's standard. Well, that implies some sort of a setup. So I've got to be able to go there, um, get myself registered as a developer or, or something and get it provisioned and figure out how, you know, whatever the, the payment might be. That should all happen in, in kind of seconds, minutes, hours at the most, um, not days, weeks, and months where in the old yeah. world, to bring on a, a supplier met like this big systems integration challenge. And that's just one giant transaction cost. So 
I, I think part of the difference is there. Well, you bring up this idea of API and, and, you know, I think maybe 25 years ago, that might've been a little bit in, in the weeds and, and, and a little, little nerdy, but you know, when I work with companies, I say, Hey, listen, you know, I don't care how technical you are or how non-technical you are. You need to understand how APIs work and you need to, un- this is sort of the connective tissue and the building block of every company now. And I, I take that same slide that says every com- you know, platforms are eating the world. And I, I cross that out and I put APIs are, are, are eating, eating the world. And so to what extent is, and, but you also mentioned that this, the concept of, of APIs, this is not just for, for software. I mean, the idea of modularity has, has been around for, for a long time and, is, and even before APIs were a thing, right? There was this notion that you need to have standardized interfaces to, to, to scale, to grow, to work well with others. Um, so how, how is this concept? And if you, you, you articulate the, the famous memo, right? The Andy Jassy memo and the, yeah. and, and the, the Yegi memo at, 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 at Google, which was really, I think a, a, a real seminal moment in, in, uh, certainly out here in, in Silicon Valley. Um, so how, imp- and how important is it for uh, a typical business leader to understand how APIs work conceptually and how integral they are to the, the organization of business. I, I, so let me answer that. Um, let me try an idea out on you. So, so I think it's super important, uh, but not at the weedy level of, of sort of explain OAuth to me or, you know, some of the, the actual code and how this thing is built. Um, but more about, you know, how do I move the organization and my verticals from consuming services from any vendor that will sell to them to consuming more standardized services? So this is a typical challenge. You know, I'm going to take the organization to the cloud. Great. I'm going to have this horizontal um, data layer system because I've learned that that's how platforms work. And then you can build lots of, of great stuff on top of it. All makes sense. Um but then the devil is in how do you migrate the existing systems over? And so it's that reusability mm-hmm. that is part of the deduplication, if you will. Um, because once you mount up this new cloud system, now you're running two and you're incurring all of that cost. So there has to be a timeline and a pathway to turn it off and the old stuff. And it's going to be the standardized APIs that make that transition path cheaper, faster, quicker. And so that gets pretty expensive. And depending upon the firm and the scale, we may be talking hundreds of millions or, or in some cases, billions of dollars. And you know, that's a boardroom and a, and a management team set of issues. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, 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 you cite the famous memo and one line of which is that every one of these interfaces has to be externalizable. And, and I, I kind of dig into this point a lot in my classes, right? This idea that you, you don't know ahead of time, the purposes to which some functionality might be put. And so you don't know who your, your customer might be. It might be the person down the hall, or it might be a person on the other side of the planet. It might be someone who's, you know, internal, someone who's external. And so you have to have that, that, you know, that, that switch, that, that on off switch, how, how important is that, right? Uh, I mean, obviously, if you're a platform company, you know, everything has to be a- externalized, but uh, at least those things that are building blocks of your platform. But, but, you know, we don't know ahead of time the exact configuration, right? If you think you know what the business model is on day one, then you're, you're, you're deluded, right? So, so yeah. you need to have this, this flexibility. Um, and Amazon's, had, they converted from, using primarily FedEx and UPS to, to primarily internal delivery. And they did this in a, in a relatively seamless and painless way, I think, because of this architecture. Yeah. So, so let's go to that issue of externalizable, because I think that that decision um, is a really interesting one. It didn't say that every API will be exposed publicly, mm-hmm. just that it be designed so that it can be. Mm-hmm. And I think it's that optionality that's really important. Um, and I think that optionality is 
a way to think about the investments in technology um, that would even facilitate a platform. And so a lot of times what you'll see in, in kind of technology investment scenarios and justifications is you'll have some sort of ROI. It'd be like, this is the benefit either on a cost savings or a revenue increase. This is the cost. This is the payback period. Hallelujah. We'll either do this or we won't. That's a point solution. And that's kind of applicable again in the ways that, um, we built these, these pipeline businesses. Once you start investing in infrastructure, and that's exactly what that kind of externalizable API is. Now you're entering a different kind of financial model. You're, you're really building an options model that mm -hmm. says, well, I don't really know what the future is, but I'm going to close off some paths of potential payoff unless I incur this expense to make this generalizable. And so that then says, Hey, I've got a different investment kind of way or, or model that I need to start thinking about. Um, and you could see that in that memo, I think right there. Right. And so I think there's a general principle here, which is that in a world where there's a lot of uncertainty, right. Um, investing in, in something that, that doesn't have this optionality is going to probably in the long run, you know, cost you. Uh, and so do you have to think about it from day one? How do you retro, how do you retroactively kind of take something that was built uh, in, in a more appliance like format and, and convert it into this, this modular system. Um, you know, it's interesting. Some things actually do just need to do a single thing and do it really well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can, other things can be built in this kind of more modular format. So I think it's, it's being intentional about where you need to be delivering kind of basic electricity and just mm -hmm. do it at scale, um, basic compute, do it at scale, um, versus, okay, now I've got to have this mix and match reusability and that's where I'm going to invest in making that possible. Yeah. So but I think that the by, the byproduct of this, this, this organizational architecture is that you're, you're, you're facilitating the creation of these internal marketplaces, right? So you have essentially, if you're working in, in an organization that's organized like this, then you ha each employee has kind of an app store where, you know, it's full of native apps that, that they can use as building blocks for, you know, whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish within the organization. Right. So, so I love that metaphor and I, I know one organization, I'm not going to name them. It's a, it's a large one that you'd be familiar with, but they're working on their, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning systems and, and they're trying to basically centralize those, um, but not by force. It's sort of offer some candy. And so here, for example, are standardized templates, they're standardized models. Here are data sets that you can use and, you know, we can help you, or you can just take this and, and rip mix and burn. And oh, by the way, if you need to productize it and make it repeatable, there's going to be help, um, with that. And that's trying to take a big organization that's been in business for many decades and kind of bring them to this reusable kind of modular concept because, and then the, the kind of final part of that is, and then the models go back into the store, if you will, for consumption by others. So that you try to harness the learning that occurs in one division or in one area and expose that for others. Right. And it's kind of like treating, treating the internal people like customers, right? So that you, it's not just that you and have that customers. Is a huge yeah. point. And, and it's one, I think that's, and when we talked earlier about this, this idea of product before platform, it's that point that I think gets lost. Uh, you'll say, who's the, who's the customer for this thing? And then they'll go to the end. They go, well, it's this person that buys from our company. It's like, really? Wow. What was the problem that you were trying to solve? You know, that, that they had. Oh no, that's, that's not what we were doing. We were working with our internal team and then we're going to help them reach the end user. Ah, so your user and your customer is actually internal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, uh, you know, that customer mentality, uh, or, you know, making sure that you're always thinking about everybody you interact with as, as a, as a customer metaphorically is it orients the way you think about the product. 
It's hugely. And, and it, it's even more important than that because it changes the way you measure success. Mm -hmm. And that's critical, especially at launch. Because if you're worrying too much about, Hey, did I crack that giant total addressable market? Um, sure. When the system is mature, it better be getting an ROI, but at the beginning, it's gotta be a lot simpler as in did the end user, even if that's an internal one, like it, you know, did it actually solve their problem? Uh, did they have a choice or did I just ram it down their throat? Cause if they had a choice, then did they actually choose mine. So, so I want to talk a bit about metrics because, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about user growth and we talk a lot about, um, you know, comparing customer acquisition cost and lifetime value. Of course, there's virtually no way to know what lifetime value is at the beginning. Um, and user growth could be misleading, right? If we think about movie pass, right? So movie pass was yeah, that's a spectacular, <laughs> spectacular failure. Right. Um, and, but you know, by some metrics, they, they look really successful in, in, in the early days. Um, so how do you, how do you know whether you are actually creating something that has the, the lock-in features that has the, the, the characteristics of, of a, of a network that's, that's designed to last? So, so first of all, you're, you're right. Even measuring network effects, I think is, is kind of one of the the grand econometric challenges for my economist friends. So I'm looking forward to seeing them continue to improve that, that, uh, that art. Um, but if, if you think about the metrics, so yeah, just raw numbers of users is kind of pointless because that doesn't tell you why they're with your system. Mm -hmm. That doesn't tell you what value they're getting from it. It doesn't tell you the level of engagement. It doesn't tell you whether they're recommending you know, the system to others, people like them, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are some areas you'd, you'd look at literally activity. You'd look at engagement. Um, you'd look at drop off, mm -hmm. um, or growth in usage, um, are, are a few things. And then I think another one is if you think about these systems as designed to make matches, where are the failures? When did people, when did people search for something? and fail to find it. And those are, are areas where you have to pay a lot of attention to. I think one of the most interesting issues in the design of, of a platform is this idea of openness, uh, versus, versus control. Um, and you know, obviously there's a, there's a spectrum and there's also a bunch of different dimensions along which you can be more open or, or more, more closed. Um, and you, you distinguish this idea of you know, sponsorship versus, versus, uh, management. And, and, um, I, I thought this was a unique contribution. Could, could you talk a bit about, um, sort of, you know, what are the trade-offs? Because the answer is, of course, it depends, but what are, what are the trade-offs yeah. between having a more open system and, you know, are there specific sectors or specific types of, of matching or products that are more, um, amenable to, to open governance versus something more closed? Uh, yeah. So first of all, I think, so you raise a super point and it's probably worth just explaining it to, to your viewers. Um, the notion of the sponsorship is that entity that essentially controls and does rule setting. So they control the trajectory of the platform. They get to decide what the standards are. You know, we're going to operate in pounds or dollars or euros and, you know, what the technology footprint or trajectory will look like. Um, but critically who gets to play and then kind of what the rules of the game are. Then the next layer, and we, we were really interested and this is work that goes back to, uh, um, to Marshall and I worked with Tom Eisenman, uh, really in the early two thousands, um, to kind of help tease this apart. And we had this interesting notion of, you know, some organizations and platforms, they split that role. Mm -hmm. And so they have maybe a single firm that sponsors and then lots of firms that can provide. And at the time there was still the, the kind of operating system wars. So we used, for example, Microsoft Intel as the partnership that sponsored. And then all the kind of equipment makers were the end providers. Um, 
Similarly, you might think of uh, Android as a sponsor of um, the operating system and then lots of handset providers. And, you know, we can talk about the, you know, whether that sort of the strengths and weaknesses of that example. Um, or you've got Apple iOS, they own the, uh, the, the uh, kind of IP and the rights around the system. And they also have declared that they will alone supply the customer facing at least equipment. Um, so different choices. And then, you know, you ask, well, why? Well, sometimes you can't go it alone. And so, for example, we made a, you know, used the Visa example where one bank could try to sponsor one credit network, mm -hmm. but you could have an awful lot of competing credit networks. So that was going to be hard to get scale. And so by having them jointly sponsor one standard, it was a lot easier to mobilize both users of credit and then acceptors on the merchant side. And so in that situation, the kind of one bank was never going to be big enough to go it alone. Right. So in, we have situations where Facebook, for instance, was kind of a, a open free for all initially. And then it, it kind of, well, actually, I mean, it, it, it started closed in terms of its membership, right. With right. Harvard and then opened up to anybody, but in terms of, um, you know, extension developers, it was more kind of open initially with, with Zynga and everybody else, you know, jumping in and, you know, Cambridge Analytica. And then they kind of, kind of closed that, that port down somewhat. But then we have other stories where Apple, for instance, you know, with, uh, the, um, iPhone one that had almost entirely native, all native apps, Google sort of honorary native app. And then, you know, it opened up, but it's, it's still not quite as open as the, uh, as the, um, uh, you know, the, the Android, uh, store, but then, but that, you know, they, they went from being, uh, much more permissive in terms of their, their licensing of the operating system to being a little bit more controlled. So, you know, I, I think it's kind of hard to draw some general rules, uh, about the degree of openness. When, when I remember when I first started teaching about the Betamax story, sure. um, uh, which occurred around the same time as the, um, near death of, of of the Apple ecosystem, you know, everyone was arguing that openness, 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 openness is, is, is you know, the most, as much openness as you can, you might have to give up some of the, the, the profit, but it's really the only way to establish these things. I think we have a much more nuanced understanding at this point. Yeah, I fully. And I think what's fascinating is that successful examples can coexist. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't think anybody would now say oh, that was the only path to go open. Mm -hmm. I do think that if you have an established network that's, you know, again, like, like the Apple iOS, um, you're a lot more likely to be able to enter the market with the open coalition strategy. And then if you think about the way that they did that, they ran a bunch of contests to create sort of different apps by category. Um, but on the supply side for the handsets, I think there's a really interesting story where they created essentially reference designs that they just open sourced. So to, Hey, here, take it. And that way we'll incur some of the fixed engineering costs, um, to make sure that we'll have an adequate supply of devices that can run this thing. Now look at the heart of all of this is, is data, right? And, and you make that point repeatedly through the book that at, at, at at a fundamental level, all of these platforms, uh, are sustained by the data that they gather, right. And they can use this for a variety of purposes, not just as do the gatekeeping better, uh, to do the matching better, to, to kind of curate, um, uh, the, the flow of, of, of products better. Um, but this also then is kind of a, a, a rebirth of this resource-based view of the firm, right? So. So, you know, we talk about how the, the resource-based view of the firm has kind of been replaced by this, this different view, but, but then kind of the resource view is making a comeback, but the resource is, is, is the data. And, and in that view, right, in that old view of, uh, it's not, I guess it's old now, but that view of, of strategies sort of dictates where you can win. It dictates kind of what are the adjacencies, what, what's the shape of the firm, right? Where are you going to go? Where can this data be, be redeployed? But ex ante, it's kind of hard to tell, right? I mean, if we look at the configuration of say, um, you know, Tencent in, in China, it's like, okay, 
messaging plus tra- plus you know transactions. That makes perfect sense. But then you go over to the U.S. and you're like, but wait, you know, messaging and transactions aren't under the same roof. Hmm, that's weird. Uh, and then it's like, oh, operating system and search they make perfect sense, but you don't see that, you know. In ch- so like, how is there is there some degree of contingency here in in terms of how firms leverage the the data that they're 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 collecting um how does how do you strategically think about um the different kind of paths that you can take with with your with your platform once you've started to ingest uh mass amounts of data um super question and i think i think your point about it there isn't a a, a general rule here that's going to be satisfactory uh I think part of it is going to be regional. So for example, there were many fewer restrictions on what could be done with data in China. That's starting to change now. Um, and you can kind of run down the, the, the rationale for that. But, uh, I think firms were much freer to share data, to recombine it, to use it for all kinds of purposes, targeting, marketing create new ser- services in China than they were in the, in the U S um, in Europe, but really in the U S so that that's part of the story. Um, I think there's been kind of, I don't know if a weird restraint, uh, if you look at the big firms, they have probably stuck to their lanes more than you might've expected relative to kind of this white hot competition that you see in China. Um, yeah you know, where that is just a super tough market. And so the firms that emerge are, uh, are, are, you know, victors among thousands. And yeah, when um, I think about Amazon, it's like, I mean, network television makes perfect sense for Amazon, right? I mean, they can, they can, they know exactly what you're going to buy and you know, they could do the attribution, yeah. right? It's like it's pretty simple. You know, you run an ad and then you're like, oh, boom. And you buy it like two seconds later. I mean, it, it would, it would make perfect sense for them to be just running network television, but they, but they don't. So, um, they, they are ex- exercising some restraint. Well, inter- yes and no, right? Because we don't actually know what's going on in there in the sense that they can easily do product placement and shows mm-hmm. and get all that same attribution. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, and we certainly know in the social media firms that ads in the social media can now be tracked directly to point of sale. And -hmm. so that technology has been in place for years. Um, so there's a pretty strong feedback loop. Now, one of your chapters, you talk about governance and, and I, I I like this discussion because it it says that, look, as these things, these things are kind of, um, they're, they're governance institutions, right? And governance is really the key challenge that most of the challenges associated with building out successful platforms are not technological ones that we more or less have the, the technology there's about mm-hmm. identifying the opportunities there's about uh, doing the, the proper getting the go-to-market right getting the pricing right and we talked about all that but at the end of the day it really boils down to, to to governance and if if the governance is wrong then the whole thing kind of falls apart and you use analogies to to governments um governments have a few tools available to them that 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 the, uh, uh, the, the platforms don't have. Um, but, but, you know, how, how should we be, what kind of metaphors should we be thinking about when we think about platform governance? Um, so actually I, I'll answer that, but I think this interplay of platform governance and literally national governments is an interesting one. Um, so the way that I think about platform governance is do they have rules essentially to ensure fair treatment of users. And so this is like, this is like it, almost like due process. Do they use exactly essentially do they use due process, right? Yeah. Is there due process and do they have the ability to actually credibly deliver that? So if you have a dispute, is there a resolution mechanism? Mm-hmm. Um, if they said they're going to charge 10% or whatever, did they, or did they charge 50? Mm-hmm. Um, if they said they weren't going to, uh, basically replicate your technology and, and, uh, end up sort of destroying your particular app or business. Did they adhere to that in a credible way? Um, so that's the governance side. I think where it gets interesting is on the national government side, 
to look at whether the platform a has governance principles that make sense. So they're not all about self-dealing and uh, sort of the attempt to maintain dominance or abuse dominance. Um, and if so, do they actually adhere to them? Uh, then probably less heavy handed regulation, whereas others that don't have those are, are asking for external intervention. Yeah. I, I wonder if there's going to be a new area of law and maybe, uh, you know, Marshall could speak to this better, but it's, there's a new area of law called govern, you know, platform law because, you know, corporate law emerged out of a need for people to be able to pool resources as, as investors. Right. And so we have this default law that allows us to arbitrate you know, disputes whenever there's a conflict between the holders of the majority and the holders of the minority of, of the shares in a company. Um, and so because you bring together all of these different participants into this, this governance structure, um, you're having some, some background laws that, that could be leaned on to, to help make this, this system beneficial for everybody might, might be, uh, might be useful. But at at the moment, it seems that all of the the rules are are, are created by the the, the platform uh, sponsor, right? For the most part, and, and I think you're really starting to see a lot of action in this space. So if you look at the Digital Markets Act in the European Union, uh, I'd say that's trying to take this issue head on. Um, and you know, there's some things in that that don't necessarily make a hundred percent sense, but um, a lot of it does in the sense of thinking, well, how do you think about data? Who owns it? Mm -hmm. How do you ensure fair access? Um, how do you think about self preferencing and is that always harmful or in fact, was it the case that the platform offered the best deal, um, for a particular end user? And then what are the dyna dynamics? You know, if that's true in time period one, does that sort of lead to trouble down the road? So, yeah, I think I just laid out the lawyers and platform economists full employment act, yeah, um, because sure. kind of nailing all of this down, is going to, is going to take a lot of analysis and effort. Well, the, all the people who are in this new antitrust movement are arguing that these monopolies are here to stay and that we need to regulate them, but th there's a whole group of people who would say, well, not so fast, right? These things aren't as, um, locked in as they appear and, and they can point to examples of how, you know, uh, Microsoft's, uh, dominance in operating system space kind of eroded and, um, and how, you know, if Apple gets too, um, abusive towards its, its, uh, developers, then they just switch to Android or, you know, you can look at the collapse of things like Lotus one, two, three, and say, well, you know, that should have in theory been locked in forever and it, and it disappeared pretty quickly. Uh, so, you know, is, is, do you see this, do you see these, these platforms as being as kind of less or more vulnerable than, than the consensus appears to be? Um, so. I, I had a conversation with, uh, Farhad Manju at the, the New York times columnist about, I don't know, five years ago. Mm -hmm. And he had just written his column on, I think the frightful five, mm -hmm. you know, which you will all recognize the gaff. I'm arguing exactly what you just said, that these are, are qualitatively different. Um, and they're likely to be around for a long time. So my take was, well, you know, history is long, <laughs> hasn't been written yet, uh, and not so fast. Uh, and then they have done nothing but sort of explode and skyrocket. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you have to have a certain humility in, <laughs> in reflecting mm -hmm. on, on what you say. But, but that being said, um, you know, we're, we've got a lot of interesting new technologies, you know, we might have mm -hmm. quantum computing coming on. We've got all of this biotechnology, which is a whole explosive new space. We've got what's very likely to be this kind of rise of internet of things, B2B, machine to machine. It's, I think, fanciful to think there are only five or 10 firms on planet earth that are going to play in sort of these super high growth areas. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll probably start to see the limits of ad sponsored, um, kind of revenue models 
Mm -hmm. especially in some of these other contexts. And so you have to believe there will be space and you can kind of see the gathering steam of competition, um, especially around this industrial set. Now, at the end of the book, you, you point to uh, the future and, and you say, well, there are three industries that, that seem to be resisting the, the platform revolution and their healthcare, finance, and education. And I, I think, um, you know, finance has, has I think, I think we, we've seen a lot of changes in the world of finance. Um, but healthcare and education still seem to be a little sticky. I mean, obviously Coursera is, is one example in education, but you know, healthcare, uh, for, as someone who had the same tooth x-rayed like five times by five different dentists in the span of a week, you know, it, there's clearly some, some room for improvement in healthcare. Um, and of course these are regulated industries, but I mean, education is not quite as regulated. So one would think that education, uh, would move more quickly to the platform business model. What's the hold back in, what's the hold back in education? I actually asked, um, David Yaffe, the same question a couple of days oh. ago, right? What, what, what is, what is holding us back in, in education? Why don't we have a more, you know, modular, uh, system here? Why don't we have, uh, you know, the emergence of, of new platform? I mean, in India, you have Baiju, I see is, is, is turning into something like this, this platform, but why don't we have that, uh, in, in education? So it's a great question. And I think it really goes to what's the value proposition. And so if you think for your average 18 to 22 year old, sure, the learning is part of the value proposition, but it may not even be central. And I, I just, uh, had the last of my two kids, uh, complete college and for sure they learned a lot, but for sure they wanted to be there with the other young people on premises, bouncing off of each other. Um, so that on education, I think is, is part of it, at least for, um, at least for the young, the young folks, I think, I think where the real action is likely to happen is going to be in the, the kind of lifelong learning space, if you will, and where we're likely to, to see Innovation is this idea of kind of stackable credentialing. And I think Coursera maybe even coined that term, who knows, but, um, they've certainly used it. Uh, and once you can get away from the notion that, Hey, the only person that's competent to do a thing, um, uh, is somebody who has a degree from, you know, grand university, ABC, which is, should be roundly laughed out of the room, uh, at this stage anyway, to kind of more dem demonstrable skills. Now that works great for things like coding or things that are relatively easily measured. So where these systems have to go is how do I measure, you know, um, stick to itiveness, uh, grit, if you will, um, ability to play well with others. Uh, well, the current, current educational system doesn't do that. <laughs> we don't do a very good job <laughs> of measuring that either. Right. So. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> anything so will do I better than what we've got. <laughs> so I think, I think, I think we'll start to see it, but kind of the last to go in, in my belief is, is the, the kind of 18 to 22 year old, mm -hmm. um, just because there's such a strong, it's, you know, a natural life cycle to want to get out of mom and dad's house and, yeah. or, you know, whatever the family unit might be. Um, yeah, but we could, you could unbundle that. And then, you know, come up with new oh, types trust of, me. of bundles, right? you know, and the experiment we just ran with COVID, I think is very, very instructive to say, well, you know, what parts of that actually worked pretty well mm -hmm. and what parts of that were just terrible. Um, and some of what we did online was actually pretty effective. And so I'll give an example. I teach a data analytics course. So, you know, R and Python and machine learning and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so when you do it online on zoom, which it was on zoom, everything is videoed. Mm -hmm. And then I use like a little pen and stylus. If I want to do some writing or equations or something, and then I'm banging away on a keyboard. And so that's all recorded. And so what the kids do is they go back and then that becomes a reusable resource that they go yeah, back to again and, again and again. Yeah. And if, if I had just done it in class, it would come and it would go. And so in many ways, the experience for the learner was better in that environment than 
I mean, certainly the social experience was better in person, but the learning might well have been improved. And so how can we kind of harness that, but also mix it with the social? Yeah. I think universities are still kind of in this pipeline model where, uh, you know, speaking as someone who has been affiliated with, uh, many, uh, institutions of higher learning from MIT and, uh, uh, you know, kids that went to Princeton and then, uh, I work at Dartmouth and, uh, you know, I spent a lot of my career as a, as a faculty member at Tulane, they're not always innovating at the highest rates to say the least. Um, and I think there's, if you look, the institutions have inertia, which is both helpful. So they're conservative. They protect their brands. You refer to it as the organizational metabolism, I think in the book, (laughs) um, that term, but on the other hand, the, you know, COVID was the thing that made them actually experiment. I, I think that pushed everybody on in higher ed forward by a decade. Well, Jeff, look, this has been great. I, I can't wait until you revise the book because the examples in here, I mean, it's, it, there's tons of examples in here, but there's so many examples that have happened since publication that you can, you can add into the next edition. Um, it's really been a treat chatting with you. Hope we can uh, catch up again soon. Well, Greg, thank you so much for having me and, um, really appreciate the support and interest in the book because honestly, it's a big lift to do a, a revision and, uh, the fact that there's interest and demand in that for that, um, sort of gives us the, the push that we need. Um, well, I, sh- I, I should, al- I should also mention, the, I should also mention the event that you have every year, right? The platform conference, which uh, is on, was it online this year? It was online. Um, and that's an interesting thing because, you know, to those learnings, we'll probably keep it hybrid from now on. Mm-hmm. because yeah. we've tripled our, our participation or even more as a result of it being online. Yeah. Well, I'll put, I'll make sure I'll put a link to that conference in, in the, uh, in the podcast webpage, but again, thanks so much for joining me. This is Unsiloed brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 